Warning, this video spoils the entirety of the chapters covered here within. If you wish to experience them without being spoiled, turn back now. Okay, so, um, this is a very late video, and I'm gonna explain the runtime real quick, because I have a very strong feeling that this is gonna be a much longer video than I usually upload. And the reason for that, and the reason why I've literally disappeared for, like, three weeks, um, is my Wi-Fi got turned off. That's, that's literally it. So I couldn't review chapter 1054 all the way through, and I couldn't review, um, Chainsaw Man chapters. So, like, it kind of hurt me, not gonna lie. So, what I'm gonna do is, when I thought this was just gonna be a one-week break, basically, I recorded, um... 10.54 and uh, 99, I believe it was, for Chainsaw. I recorded them in one video, and I had it ready to upload whenever I could. But it became a two- to three-week break. So I decided, I took the reins, and I decided that I will. I am going to be doing a, basically a colossal review, if that makes sense. Um, I'm going to be, re I'm going to be reviewing, talking through, walking through, chapter... 1054, 1055, and 1056 of One Piece, and then I believe it's chapter 99, 100, and 101 of Chainsaw. Maybe not 101 if I remember correctly. It might just be 100. I'm going to check real quick. Uh, I don't think 101 is out yet. So, okay, no, 101 is out. Okay, that makes sense. So, we have three chapters of each to review. Six reviews in this video. And um, I'm going to do a thing that I usually don't do. Usually the picture on the screen is the exact chapter that I'm talking about. That's not what's going to happen here. I'm going to leave up the picture for the chapter, of the first chapter, just so you know what series I'm talking about. But the text is going away. So that there's no confusion. I'm not just talking about that one chapter. I'm talking about the entire thing. Um, and also, I bought a uh, cap shooter gun at Dollar General. Because I work there now. Um, I bought one on my shift so I could open a bottle of Fanta soda. And that's going to be our signaler to move on to the next chapter. So whenever you hear this, that's when we move on to the next chapter. It is very loud. So with that first shot, we're going to be going through one piece first. Just because that's the one I've been doing longer. So, mind you, this is my first time going through the chapters since they've released. So, at the beginning of 1054, we get to see um, the vassals. The uh, Not all of them. It's uh, Nekumamushi, um, Katsu, Ka Ka the Kappa guy, <laughs> uh, Dendro, Dogstorm, Shinobu, and Raizo. And they leave the flower capsule and they go to confront um, Ryokugu because he was approaching Wano. Mind you, this is the chapter that came out after the one-month break. I would go through the uh, Road to Laugh Tale, and I still might, but not in this video, because that is a more visual-based thing. Unless I just make notes of what I want to talk about. Um, so, we get to see that Rizo and uh, Dendro are talking, and Rizo identifies them as he's from the Marines, and Dendro is able to put that together as they're Luffy's enemies from, over the, from across the sea. And then we get to see more of Ryokugyu's, um viewpoint, or his philosophy, I guess. And he says, using the Viz translation, because TCB is um, the spawn from the website I use. So you know how things work outside of here. The Celestial Dragons are the gods of the world. And here in a country unaffiliated with the world government, you have no human rights. Don't blame me for it. It's how the world works. So he is a very, very adamant believer in how the world is supposed to work given how it's worked for how long with the celestial dragons being top of the top and if your country is unaffiliated with the world government sucks to suck we don't do anything about it and then he shows off the power of his forest forest fruit i refuse to call it the woods woods fruit because that's a stupid name um so that was that we find out that it's a logia fruit it is pure Logia, as he refers to it. Because I believe Logia is nature, or something from nature. 
His is pure Logia as it is nature itself incarnated. Um, and then he says, and then he continues to speak, Let me teach you something. Humankind has lasted through the ages by creating and defining the inferior. All the rest of us can look down our noses at you unaffiliated countries. And then we can see what I would consider more of his... Not his limit, because we have far more strength coming from him. But he's able to just very quickly dispatch everyone who showed up. Um, and he's talking about how the law doesn't apply here. I can kill as many people. I can kill thousands of you as long as I reach Luffy. And then we get the intro to this that I've been fucking waiting for. Because this is the one fight that I really wanted. Yamato jumps in and Thunder Baguya's Ryokugu upside the head with a Conqueror Hockey Infused Strike. And um, Ryokugu just straight up says, that's some tough hockey. Who are you? And Yamato very proudly declares, I am Yamato, the son of Kaido. And mind you, this is after Kaido goes down. So this is Yamato actually expressing that Yamato is Yamato. I'm avoiding pronouns like I've said. I don't want to get into that whole thing. But if if Yamato is to be believed currently, Yamato is a he. The son of Kaido. Just just follow that real quick. Um, so we Yamato is declaring that I am the son of Kaido. And Ryo Kyugu has heard nothing of this. But Momonosuke comes in and has the dialogue. Well said, Yamato. The heroes have yet to heal from their battle, and we won't allow you to harm them. Blast breath! He attempts to use Kaido's blast breath, but it doesn't work. So, instead he does the thing that he does best. He bites him. Oh yeah, he bites him alright. Like a full latch on chomp bite. And he says, do not make them worry. I swore an oath to them in reference to protecting the capital. Or just the country in general. And Ryokugu says, a pink dragon? That's weird. I haven't heard of anyone with those powers. Move it! And he very quickly just uses a bunch of trees to, I guess, grab Momonosuke and hold him up. And Yamato is ready to fight again. And Momonosuke tells Yamato straight up, do not fight. And then we get to see the part of the chapter that really set people off online. Not set people off, that sounds bad. But made people talk. It was the fact that Shanks is here. Shanks is in the seas near Wano. And we get to see that the crew... Sorry, that was a misfire on the gun. My part, oh, That's on me. And the crew really wants to go see Luffy because they're just outside of Wano. And um, y uh, Yasop has the dialogue. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm ready to see uh, Usopp. Everyone's super happy of how far Luffy's come. Someone talks about the fact that Kid is here. Uh, and he's got to pay for picking a fight with us. But Shanks is just sitting there looking at Luffy's bounty poster, which has him awakened in Gear 5th. Mind you, Shanks took the Devil Fruit from page 6, way before the series started, like probably at least a few months before Chapter 1 itself was there. They took the fruit from CP9 agents. Page 6 just straight up says there's no treasure here it's only a single devil fruit and it's just the gumu gumu no me why do you want it so bad and we don't get to see anything from shanks like why he took it or any dialogue about that but we get to see them docking in uh luffy's village luffy excited that shanks is there uh the crew at the bar we get to see shanks and luffy talking and then we get to see the moment where shanks lost his arm and then Shanks touches his uh, stump. And then we get to see some of the lower uh, crew of the Red Hairs say, Guess all the bosses know that Straw Hat Luffy guy. You know about you kn you know what I heard about Straw Hat Luffy? That he's like some uncontrollable monster ape of a man. At least that's what they say. And then Shanks destroys our dream. And all he says is, I'm not interested in seeing Luffy. Remember what's happening in our territory now? And he, in reference to Bartolomeu who is burning down the red hair flags and putting up Luffy's. So Shank says, so how that look, so how that make me look? What happens to the trust put in me? So he's very he's going very respect based. He doesn't want to just talk to Luffy cuz to the rest of the world, Luffy is his rival. He's a Yonko. So, he doesn't want to just 
talk to him just in case word gets out. And then he sits down and he says, Hey, Beck, I think it's time we make our move. Let's claim the One Piece. And just that last panel of Let's Claim the One Piece is the reason why Phil and Shanks theories have been going off nonstop. Sure, the next few chapters after this have given a little bit more context and helped prove one side and the other one that they might be in the right. Pro villain Shanks, post uh, anti villain Shanks. Just the way Shanks is drawn, with half his face obscured, and the fact that he is blatantly saying it is time to make our move. Which, if you will remember, Oda made a very similar comment the red hair will make his move. And I think that was for the 2020 Jump Festa, so it was supposed to happen last year. But as tends to happen, One Piece got a little bit slower than anticipated, which is fine. More stuff to feed on. My guess is um, uh, Sanji and Zoro's fights probably weren't supposed to last as long as they did, but they did. Um, and then we get to cut to the Marines. We're getting a lot of different points of view here. And I'm not going to go through this entire section word for word reading it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boil it down. Sabo killed Cobra. And now he's being um, framed as the Flame Emperor, or in Japanese, Enkai, which is, uh, I believe it was Ace's Flame Pillar move. Or it was the Big Sun move, one of the two. And, mind you, Cobra is one of the 20 founder descendants. He is from a country, he is from one of the kings who created, quote-unquote, this new world. And we get the one part of this that I will read as of now, um, which is why his murder was so meaningful to the Revolutionary Army. There was um, an attack that landed there that destroyed the Hoof of the Celestial Dragons, which is a symbol of the World Nobles, which declared war. Um, Fujitora and Ryokugu fought, but the Revolutionaries were able to hold them back, and they were able to reclaim Kuma, which, if you'll remember... Um, he was being held, not hostage, but as a slave um, on Marajoua with one of the world nobles using him as basically a horse. And similarly to Cobra's murder, Vivi has disappeared. Uh, and this is where I'm going to put in what I think happened. I'm not going to let um, that breathe for too long. I don't think Cobra was actually murdered by Sabo. I don't think that would be in Sabo's like interests. Well, it would be in his interests because of the revolutionary, but that wouldn't be really in his character. Uh, we've seen that Sabo is, yes, he can fight. He is he has a tendency for violence as he is a revolutionary. Um, and following One Piece logic, revolutions can only happen through violence. As we have seen with Dress Rosa, with Alabasta, that stuff just has to have violence. So Sabo is very capable of having violence. He, we've seen it just straight up. But I don't think he killed Cobra. I think that mission on Marajoie was simply to recover Kuma and maybe start a war with the uh, world government but not kill one of the world nobles. So I think something happened, probably with Lucci, because we can't forget that he's there too. Um, I think something happened with Lucci, where Cobra ended up getting killed, and probably worrying for Vivi's safety, because Vivi is a friend of uh, Luffy. Sabo takes her with the revolutionaries under, the di under either the guise of we're taking her hostage or just straight up being like, this is one of my brother's friends. I'm not letting her die. We have to protect her. And she also might prove as a valuable bargaining chip. It could be both. Um, so that's what I think happened. I don't really think Sabo just straight up murdered Cobra, but we'll see. Um, and we can see that eight nations are revolting currently. And they are all praising Sabo as the Flame Emperor. Mind you, this is right when Luffy is being held up as an emperor as well, an emperor of the sea. So... We have a Yonko and we have an Enkai, uh, the Flame Emperor and the uh, Emperor of the Sea, which is really cool because if you think about it, Ace was kind of on his way to become the quote-unquote, I guess you could say, Flame Emperor if his life wasn't cut short during Marine Force. He was on a very good path. He had, a lot, he had the bloodline. He had the inspiration through Whitebeard. He had the connections with Luffy and... Through that extension, Shanks, which is another Yonko. Kaido was on the way to Marineford, possibly to save him. Because of the whole uh, K 
king, queen, and ace thing, and jack. So possibly all that. So we have what could have been a flame emperor with uh, ace. We have the emperor of the sea with Luffy. And we have the actual flame emperor with Sabo. Um, say what you will about Sabo being planned. I don't really believe he was super planned. There were hints of him, but I don't think he was meant to be a major thing um, until Marine Ford, really. Because we had hints that maybe he existed, like very questionable hints, like the scene in um, uh, Logetown with the execution, the black hat uh, amongst all the white. Say what you will about him being planned, but he's making cool, he's a cool plot point for this. And um, a, a, one of the Marines, I believe it's the detective guy, um, says that he might have even he might even have more influence than Dragon himself. And Akainu, to finish out the chapter, says, "This is one hell of an age I had to be Fleet Admiral in. But no matter who comes at us, I'll drive each and every one of them back into the depths of the sea." Which is really cementing the fact that Akainu is this big, strong marine who doesn't believe... He has a zero-tolerance policy for uh, piracy. He just doesn't like him at all. At all. Um, so that is the end of 1054. My thoughts, it was a very good chapter to come back um, after break, but I personally think uh, Oda could have probably gotten away with releasing that chapter before he went on his break to give us a little bit more to feed on, because Ryukyuku just approaching... Um, the flower capital isn't as much as the question of why is Momonosuke not letting Yamato fight? Um, why is Shanks on Wano? Or I guess outside of Wano. Um, what's happening with Sabo? I think that chapter just gave us, could have given us more to feed on for a month. But maybe he didn't want to do that. Maybe he didn't want to leave us in suspense for that long. So, 1055, uh, titled The New Era. Uh, we get to see, we cut back to uh, Momonosuke and all them versus Ryokugu. And he tells Yamato, you mustn't fight. You, don't you dare strike him. And we get to see Raizo's fighting. Um, and even fire is of no effect against literal trees. Um, and we get to see that Ryokugu is draining the life out of Raizo after sticking him with um, one of his branches. And we see that no matter how much of the uh, branches you cut, it doesn't stop growing. It just comes back. Uh, to quote the Viz translation directly, for every one I cut to, for every one I cut into, another grows. So they're basically just replacing themselves. Um, and uh, Nekimomushi and Dogstorm Destroyer have asked, does he have any weaknesses? You gotta, we gotta keep mowing the grass forever. Um, and Eventually, Ryukyuku is able to grab Denjiro, Kawamatsu, Dog Storm, and Cat Viper. And then we get to cut back to another point of view, which I makes four in two chapters. Um, it's under the palace in Sake, uh, Sukuyaki's secret chamber, which if you'll remember, um, he revealed himself to Robin. And he straight up says, I'm surprised you sniffed us out, or Law says, sorry, I'm surprised you sniffed us out, you weren't with the other, so obviously I was suspicious. Don't act like I'm some kind of hyena. So it was Robin actually saying that. Sorry. But um, Robin and Law are together with Saka uh, Sukuyaki. And we find out that where the um, Poneglyph is held, he never told Kaido or Orochi about it. But Jack was a fishman, so he discovered the Poneglyph real quick because it's underwater. And, um, sorry. Law and Robin continue going down, and Sakayuki talks about it. And he says, it's several centuries in the past. And uh, Robin asks where light is coming from, and they go through this tiny little, I guess, chasm or hole to look. And there is a whole city underwater. Like, possibly one of the very, possibly one of the, um, fuck are they called? Districts or regions? Basically one of those underwater. And, uh, Sukuyaki tells us that is Wano of about 800 years ago. A different Wano. It means just as I said. But every 
but whatever happened in the past is unclear to me. The fact that this is not seawater probably explains its good preservation. Because the entire place is fairly well held up given it's underwater. Uh, you'd expect it to be run down from the seawater, the salt running against it, the brine. But it's not. It's held in fairly pristine condition. And Sukiyaki explains, What it means is there was once a Wano with an enormous Fuji mountain, which is basically a flat island with this super tall mountain in the middle of it. And at some point, great walls grew around the island and it filled up with rainwater, so people had to abandon the flooded towns at the bottom and started having to move upwards. So, probably just sea sediment and stuff building up against the sides created walls so rainwater would get trapped. And he keeps explaining, and, s and instead of keeping worry about their old cities, they created a new land on the side of the mountain for a new country, which would be Wano today. And then Tsukiyaki shows us the Poneglyph, where Robin and Law, uh, obviously, it's cool, because whatever. Um, and Robin comments that this is the third road Poneglyph, and one more and we'll go to Laugh Tale. And, um, Sugiyagi explains that Pluton is here, in Wano. And he says, he says he's never seen it himself, and he cannot show it to them. Because in order to retrieve it, the walls that flooded the villages low, and the very walls that are protecting Wano right now, which is the giant waterfall that the uh, Big Mom Pirates took forever to go up, would have to be torn down, and Wano would have to be exposed. And in that word, in that sense, opening the borders of Wano is a quite literal thing, which could possibly be what Odin wrote down in his journal on why Momonosuke didn't want to open the borders. He found out if we open the borders, this massive weapon will be available to grab. Um, our island will be open. Anyone can come on, basically. If we, want the, we don't have the bottleneck of the um, waterfall. So it's a... Not even a double-edged sword, because that insinuates there's some kind of good side to this. But it is a multi-bad thing to do. And Odin and Robin asks, why didn't Odin want that? And uh, Sukiyaki says, I've told you everything that has passed down through the Shogunate's line. I could not tell you what Odin learned in his travels abroad. But Momonosuke and Yamato could, because they read Odin's journal. So if we combine our, if we can get a big exposition from Yamato or Momonosuke about what they learned in Odin's journal, and then we combine that with what Sukiyaki has, we might be able to put together a pretty good history of Wano, and maybe even a history of how this country came to be in the first place. Maybe not, but how it's changed, definitely, why Pluton's there, everything else. And then we cut back to the fight outside the Flower Capital, where um, Ryukyuki just straight up says, Mere humans cannot challenge the might of nature itself. Don't you get it? It was P Kaido's presence that kept me from coming here. Sad as it is to admit, Kaido's rule was a deterrent that kept enemies away from this land. Which, just straight up, is true. Kaido being on Wano was a reason why no one wanted to come to Wano. They couldn't. Kaido would either kill them, exile them, or put them into slavery. But now that he's gone and the new ruler in Momonosuke hasn't shown that he can do the same thing Kaido could, people can come in all they want. There's no big deterrent. Um, and then he demands Luffy, once I've taken his head, I'll be on my way. And Yamato is uh, dangling from one of the thingies when Momonosuke says, we can, uh, we can rely on Luffy. No, sorry. <laughs> wrong. I read the situation wrong. Yamato says we can rely on Luffy and his friends for help. They're better than him. And Momonosuke bites back saying, that's not an option. And I won't ask for your help either. Don't bother. You've been trapped on Onigashima for all your life. And this is finally your chance to be free. So I'm giving you a proper send off. Luffy, Zoro, and the rest. I've had, I've had them fighting my battles for me all this time. We're the ones who will stay behind in our country. We must be able to drive off any enemy. If we ask for help... From those who are about to leave, then we will never be able to protect Wano. Which is another really good speech from Omonosuke. The kid couldn't put together basically any words back on um, Punk Hazard, but now he's just spouting out these amazing speeches. And he makes a very good point. You cannot rely on Yamato, who's going to be going with the Straw Hats, more than likely. You can't rely on Luffy when he's about to leave. You have to let the vassals and yourself do the job. Because... 
even if Momonosuke can't beat a, um, an Admiral right now with Green Bull, he can at least prove uh, that Wano isn't about to go down without a fight. That no matter what, the citizens of Wano and the Shogun of Wano will not let the country just be taken. And then Momonosuke is actually able to summon a Blast Breath and blast through Green Bull. And Momonosuke just straight up says something came out and he's able to do it again. And Yamato asks, he mastered his dragon body? And then we see that Green Bull's body is completely ignited, but he's able to grow a new body through sprouts. So he's able to, it's like he's growing a human body out of plants, whatever. Because he is a Logia type, so that makes sense. And he asks, are you trying to burn down the entire city? So you mean business. Fine. But you're a pitiful replacement for Kaido. I'll skewer you from tail to mouth. And then some black lightning fills the panel. And Green Bull is completely petrified. Cannot move. He goes from big monster form to human form like that. And he asks, that's Conqueror's Hockey. Who's doing that? And he's somehow able to put together that it's the red-haired pirates and asks if they're nearby. I don't get Shanks' biggest monologue, I think, ever in the series. Maybe except Marine Ford. After someone asks, uh, you have to go easy with the sudden hockey blast. The new guys are already foaming at the mouth. And Shanks has the monologue. Now, I'm not accusing you of fighting dirty, dirty Marine. But when the new shoots that just changed pirating history are exhausted from their feet, don't you think that you're doing what you're doing is a bit much? Are you that afraid of the new era? And after and before he says that last line, he thinks about Luffy when they first met, when Luffy gave himself his scar, Momonosuke and Odin growing up on the um, on Roger's ship, uh, Hiyori and Toko uh, Toki when they were on the ship. So he's reflecting on his entire life, and he is genuinely asking, even though Green Bull can't actually hear him, he can probably put his thoughts through his Conqueror's Hockey, which might explain re uh, Green Bull's reaction, which is, look, I'm not picking a fight with you guys. Not yet. Okay, okay. And he walks away. And then we can see more people partying in Wano, uh, Brooke and the rest of the Straw Hats having fun. Um, and then we can see that Sanji, Luffy, Zoro, and Jinbei are watching the fight. And Sanji says, oh, we don't get to fight. And Zoro replies, not bad, Momo, not bad. And then, um, I believe it's Jinbei who says this next line. Says, that was some monstrous hockey being thrown around, though. It does sound like Zoro's line, though. And Luffy asks, yeah, what was that? It made me think of a familiar face. As we see the Red Force seemingly departing Wano on its way to the One Piece. And that is the end of chapter 1055. My thoughts on the chapter. Again, really fucking good. Solid way of um, getting Green Bull out of Wano. Getting him away. Letting our group kind of um, get their last goodbyes. Because everyone kind of expected Green Bull to be interrupting their last goodbyes. Like he wouldn't let... Um, them like breathe take a sigh of relief and that they were gonna have to run away from wano to not have to fight him so that was that oh yeah uh we're on a 1056 titled cross guild and this is the first time in a while that we have gotten sorry misfire this is the first time in a while we've gotten to catch up with the germa siblings and they're being attacked by katakuri and oven and i have to go turn on my light so i can actually see one second literally meant like that was like 10 seconds uh <clears throat> so opening the chapter um it's a little bit after the fight with um green bull and they've been able to bring Rizo and shinobu back to the hospital and they are like they they are um they ain't looking the best <laughs> they were sucked of all of their nutrients and um someone I believe it would be um, Kinemon, uh, says, As much as I hate to admit it, that man had a point. Kaido was a tyrant, but at the same time, his presence kept enemies away. 
and he was apparently out uh, dur- at Curry during the whole fight, so that explains why he wasn't there. Um, and Cat Viper just kind of shrugs it off. Uh, what's done is done, and the damage was minimal anyway. Uh, Momonosuke saved the day, whatever. And we find out that, um, Otsuru is okay. She has a slight burn on her face. Not slight. Terrible. According to Kinemon, his exact line is, And Suru has a terrible burn on her face, but she is alive and well. So, that's cool. Um, and we see that she does indeed have half her face bandaged. Um, and she straight up says, I know I want to be at his side too. And then we get to see Kinemon um, kind, of, kind of simping a little bit. Saying, I have to say, after 20 years, she still is beautiful. And that's kind of cool. And rise up. We get the di- uh, dialogue from Rizo. Ooh, I wish I had a girl. Um, then we get to see Carrot, who we haven't seen in a long time. Um, and in one panel, we get the reveal. Carrot is gonna be the new king of um Zo. Yeah. And to explain it, Dog Viper says, The truth is, Cat and I have to stay here on Wano, and Sir Lord Mononosuke is samurai of the Kozuki clan. And then um, Cat Viper takes over. You and you are one of the very few who've been out to see have been out to see the world. That means you must have some of what some of what we'll need in the next era. And Carrot just straight up says, But there are so many people who are way stronger than me. And they and the Dog Storm Three Musketeers straight up say of course there are, but our job is to protect the country. Um, Wanda says, I'll help you too. This was the king's decision. So, um, Carrot is the king of Zo, And she also has to carry Pedro's will. Um, and then we get to see the fucking reveal. It was really, like, unexpected, not gonna lie. That... Um, Sakuyuki is revealing himself to Momonosuke and Hiyori, and, um, he apologizes, um, and he says that Momonosuke looks just like Odin, and Momonosuke kind of, I guess, disregards the apology or doesn't think it's needed because he says, we've lost our parents, just knowing that another relative is still alive is such a relief, and Hiyori, um, thinks the same thing, and, um, all the vassals apparently already knew, except Kinemon, who's thinking to himself, it, he, it was him the entire time. It's uh, At least he's alive. That's good. Um, so he's kind of beating himself up that he didn't realize. Um, uh, Sakuyuki requests that he is able to resume his seclusion from the public since this is now their era to build. And um, Kinemon just says, sure, it's glad to know you're alive, though. And now we get to see fucking Frankie. See, we're all over the place, and it's really cool. But Frankie finds out that Pluton is in the country. But Robin says, I wasn't able to see it for myself, but it is here. And mind you, Frankie burned the blueprints to Pluton way back on in his lobby. So he says, I can't believe that thing actually exists. And um, so that means that someone at some point was able to see the Pluton, or even the creator of the Pluton himself, was able to have the blueprints for it and got them out. Because I don't remember if Tom made the blueprints for the ancient weapon. I don't think he did. But someone was able to get those prints to Tom to pass them from person to person. And um, we get to see that someone asks why Odin would want to unleash such a devastating weapon with opening the borders. And... um. We can just see that Shinobu is now in her beautiful, quote-unquote, state. Because of the nutrients that got sucked out, she's fine now. And, um, Sanji, back to his old simping, I guess. Um, and we see that, um, Tama is now Shinobu's apprentice, apparently. And that's that. But then we see Karabo. Um, is eavesdropping, and he finds out the Pluton's in Wano. Um, so he's being led from fucking ancient weapon to ancient weapon. He now knows where Poseidon and Pluton are. 
Um, somebody comes to Momonosuke with reconstruction plans for each uh, region and how much money it's going to need, whatever. And he goes to ask Zoro if uh, he could teach him some sword fighting techniques, but Zoro, Luffy, Usopp, Nami, all of them, gone. Oh god, it's storming here. Um, they've already left. They said their goodbyes to everyone this morning. And you could probably ask this, um, you could probably say that this is probably them not wanting to say goodbye to the people that they grew the closest to, so Momonosuke, Kinemon, all them. And we see that the big three of the worst generation, so Law, Kid, and um, Luffy, are all departing on the exact same day. And the log post has three directions, northeast, east, and southeast. And Luffy and Kid both choose east, so they're going to argue about it, but Law chose northeast. So he gets to at least go his direction. And we find out that northeast is the most direct direction. And he gets to move the furthest ahead of everyone else, which is smart. And uh, we find out the Luffy and Kid just pick middle because of, um, you know, their children. <laughs> um, we find out that Luffy and Kid draw straws, and Luffy is now going southeast, which is the most dangerous direction, apparently, according to logic, because it's gonna be the short, it's gonna be the longest path, meaning the more danger. And we find out Luffy pulls the Yonko card, but we find out from Kid that, to quote him, but when it comes to Emperors, the one who really makes me mad is him. The genius jester Buggy, or as the TCB translation said, Buggy the Bombastic Clown. And we see that Buggy created Cross Guild, which is a group, I'm going to say, that consists of Buggy, Crocodile, and Mihawk. And while that lineup is big, that's a lot of big hitters. The one person I want to draw your attention to, if you're look, if you want to go back to the chapter, look at it. You can. If not, I'll explain it. Um, Mihawk has seemingly a scar or a wound on his shoulder chest area, which is really interesting because that doesn't look like it was a mistake. It was put there on purpose. Meaning that we might get an explanation for it. It might just be a time skip thing. Because I think this is the first time we've seen him in a long time. So, yeah. That'll be interesting to see. And this is something I called... Maybe not called. I said a while back that the only way Buggy is able to become a... The only two ways Buggy was able to become an Emperor. One. If all the other, uh, if all the other Warlords were able to be caught except him. That leaves him as the sole warlord, showing that he's the best out of all of them, up promoting him up to Yonko. Or second, he aligns himself with powerful people enough where he gets the power, because look at it, he was a warlord for how long? They think he's already powerful, and now he has the influence to pull in people like Mihawk and Crocodile. He probably has territory, which is another condition of being an emperor. So, it's just, it's one of the only ways he was going to be able to become an emperor, and it looks like it happened. And we see that Zoro just straight up says, that's not possible for Hawkeye. Like, Mihawk just doesn't roll over to serve someone. And Law comments, if he's got two people like that working for him, he deserves to be called an emperor. And um, Kid just straight up says, it seems like this cross-guild company he leads has started putting bounties out on the Marines. So we have, a, we have a bounty system for the pirates, and then we have a bounty system for the marines. So this way, I don't think they're going to be anything close to each other. So, like, an admiral is probably not going to be in what an admiral-level pirate would be. I guarantee it'll be higher because that takes a bounty hunter going against the marines and becoming a pirate, technically, to fight and get a bounty on the marines. So that's kind of cool. Makes me kind of curious um, what what some of the marine bounties that we know, like the marines that we know. So like Smoker, Tashigi, um, Virgo's dead, but what his would be. I feel like that. I really want to know, um, well, Virgo's technically not a marine anymore when he died, but you know what I mean. It's really It makes me really interested to see just how strong they view some of these people as. Um, and Kid asks if anyone has an issue with any of their courses. Uh, Law gives Killer and Kid a copy of the Poneglyph and says straight up, only a trifling man would sneak out to a head start. Uh, but in the TCB, I believe it would 
have been something. It would have it would have left a tower, sour taste in my mouth if I felt like I owed you something. So this is him basically saying, "You did a good job for what you did. Now take your award and go." Because if you think about it, Kid and Law are the two people who they fought equally as hard as Luffy, considering their power levels. Um, and Law is technically not really getting anything that he didn't earn. While Kid is, he's getting a poneglyph rubbing that he didn't work for. Um, like he didn't find the poneglyph, he didn't rub it himself, he didn't do any of that. Law is the only one of the big three who fought a really good fight against an emperor, being Big Mom. Um, was pushed to his limit, awakened his fruit, and then really didn't get noticed by anyone. Yeah, sure, he got a bounty boost. So did Kid up to uh, Luffy's level, but like. That's it, just a raised bounty. Mind you, that's a big-ass bounty, but that's still not a bounty. That, like, a bounty's only so much. He's not an emperor. He didn't get a free poneglyph. Like, that kind of stuff. Um, and... Strangely enough, Killer and Kid have this dialogue where, um... Killer says... We're gonna we're gonna have to pull out our all of our strength into this task if we want to take part in an all out war against over the One Piece. And Kid says, "You mean finding the man with the burn scar? That's not enough to go on." And Luffy asks, "Man with the burn scar? What do you mean?" Law has this really somber look on his face. Not somber, just more um, holding it in. And Robin's just curious. Those reactions would seem to me that one Luffy doesn't know what happened with Sabo. And two, the man with the burn scar is indeed Sabo. Also, something I didn't bring up with the first chapter is that Sabo was given Shanks' scar in the big panel at the end, which I'm pretty sure is just an art mistake on Oda's part, but I caught that when it first happened. I just had to say it now, so no one thought I missed that. And Kid doesn't tell Luffy because to him it's an advantage. Um, we have Momonosuke and Kinemon back in the capital or the uh, castle, and they see that Yamato is up on the roof, and Yamato says, I'm going to live the way Kozuki Odin did. And by that, I don't think Yamato means a short and tragic life. I think Yamato means a set out to sea. And that is the end of 1056, the most recent One Piece chapter. 1057 is coming out, I believe, this week. Uh, I think spoilers are already coming out as I record this. I record this on, I believe, Monday uh, the 8th. Yes, Monday, August 8th, I'm recording this on. Um, so spoilers are already coming out as they have been, and that leads me to talk about the spoiler situation after the chapter. Chapter is really good again. Big reveal with the Cross Guild. This is kind of what everyone expected. Basically, three chapters in a row of just exposition mixed in with action, um, and character resolutions and stuff like that. This is kind of what everyone expected. Um, but it's still a good way of doing it. It actually sells how Buggy is an emperor how he earned it, why he is being looked at as such a high-powered figure in the world. It makes sense. But um, the issue with the... Um, not issue. The situation with the leaks and the scans and all that stuff. And spoilers. Spoilers have been coming out quicker and quicker each week, which I used to partake in spoilers as basically a religion. Like, I would try to get the first information on a chapter just so I could start thinking ahead on who's going to be in the thumbnail and stuff. And I believe when we start getting full chapter spoilers on Wednesday, which I'm pretty sure is what it still is, those were pretty much the only spoilers. We got a small version of that on Tuesday, but then a big version on Wednesday. Picture leaks came out Thursday, then TCB does a uh, release on Friday. That was, in my opinion, fast for spoilers. And if you want to avoid it, it was hard if you're trying to partake in the One Piece side of Twitter or any social media really, but mostly Twitter. It was hard to avoid them, but you could. Now with the fact that we... Sorry about the shot. Um, now about now to the point where we are getting spoilers on Monday. Mind you, the chapter... 1056, the chapter I just reviewed, technically came out yesterday. And we are already getting spoilers for the next chapter, basically. In my opinion, and you can take this... Um, if you like the spoilers and you think it's nice that we get to know about a chapter ahead of time, imagine what it's going to be, and then see the actual product. Cool. I used to. I still do. I think it's a neat thing. But I am getting 
kind of sick of the spoilers. And I think this is a very... Like I said, full spoilers on Wednesday was fine. But at the fact that we are already getting them on when on Monday, we have... Ba- uh, Grand Lantern, if you talked about it in a video a while back, like a few weeks ago. At this point, one chapter is lasting us one week, at the least. We get first spoilers on Monday, more of the same on Tuesday. Uh, we get brief descriptions of the chapter on Tuesday. Wednesday is usually when full t- uh, spoilers come out, if not Thursday. Um, Thursday is also when picture leaks come out of a uh, picture of the magazine. Friday is when uh, TCB releases. Saturday is when people are reading TCB still and getting their views on the chapter, kind of digesting it. Sunday is when the full chapter comes out uh, on Viz. And then the next day leads you directly into Monday, which is the whole process repeating. One chapter lasts us an entire week, which makes all these chapters, in my opinion, less impactful. They do less of a job of satisfying the audience, which not at all Oda's fault. This is a completely fandom-based thing. If we, if we as a fandom didn't accept spoilers as a thing, we wouldn't have an issue, is what I'm saying. Um, but it's, if you like them, whatever, I don't really care one way or the other. It's kind of getting annoying. At this point, um, Twitter is becoming an app that I'm going to get on less and less for One Piece. Um, so yeah, that was my view on the One Piece fandom and the whole leak situation and spoilers. So, now moving on. Chainsaw Man! Oh yeah, it we've hit 45 minutes and we're just doing One Piece. Um, Chainsaw also has a part that I'm going to do my best to talk about, but I'm not going to be able to hit all the details. And I'm going to talk about that before the chapters. Even though it came out after all these chapters, it's the big thing, so I'm going to talk about it now. The trailer for the anime dropped. It was really fucking good. It was solid. We got to see uh, Mappa's animation. We got to see more of their color palette. We got a staff uh, list a little bit ago uh, with like color selection by the guy who did it for SAO. Uh, we got basically that stuff. And in the chapter, in the um, for the trailer, they did a panel and they released and they showed voice actors with the guy who voices Bakugo voicing Denji, as I'm pretty sure everyone kind of expected, and uh, Faro I, who was the voice actor for Jolene in Stone Ocean, voicing Power. And when I watched the trailer the first time, I was like, oh, I'm getting real um, Power. I'm getting real uh, Jolene vibes from Power. That's kind of cool. Um, and the first time I watched it was like a 30-second clip. It was the end of the trailer. Um, and then I watched the full trailer, and I was like, oh, no, that's just straight-up Jolene's voice actress, isn't it? And then I found out it was. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's coming out, I believe it was October of 2022. So it's fall. It's a little bit later than they said it was supposed to be summer. But at this point, I'm just happy we're getting it. <laughs> um, it looks good. The action looks well animated. MAPPA is very clearly putting their effort into it. Uh, it makes me interested to see how they're going to adapt the whole thing. Because they could just do a straight, like, 36-episode season if they want to adapt the full thing. Probably not even 36. Probably closer to, like, 30 or 25. Um, sure, it's 90 chapters, which is a lot. So I'm not going to say 25. Probably, like, 30, 33, 36. Somewhere in that area. Low thirty, low to mid-30s. And that's if they're trying to adapt the entire thing into an anime. All at once, which MAPPA... <laughs> no, they don't do. Attack on Titan is a prime example where they will probably release cores or sections of the season. Uh, take a little bit to do the rest, release that later. I hope they don't do that. Swear to God, if they do that with Chainsaw Man, I'm going to cry myself to sleep. Attack on Titan's final season was the anime I was looking forward to so much when it was revealed that MAPPA was doing it. That first trailer was super nice. And then it started airing in 2020, and it was so cool. And then part two came, and then they revealed part two is going to come out later. I was like, cool, we're going to get the final section of that. And then we saw that the final section wasn't going to come out with the second part. It's part three of the final season, which is, that's at the point where I think it got annoying. But if they're trying to do Attack on Titan Justice, whatever, I don't, I'm not going to be super critical of it, so whatever. I hope they don't do that Chainsaw Man. With Chainsaw Man, I hope that they adapt all of it in one anime straight through. If they're going to take season breaks, take season breaks, but do it normal season breaks. Don't say it's going to be Chainsaw Man Season 1, like the entire thing, and then get all the way to Chapter 98, or 97, I believe, and cut it into, like, four different sections. Either do it in one run-through or do it in different seasons. Because with the Tiger Titan, they were each basically a seasonal anime put together into one season of an actual show. Which, whatever, I don't 
care for, but some people do. I hope Chainsaw Man adapts it all into one chat in all into one go through, or they adapt to a certain point and then do a movie for the rest of it. Uh, one thing I saw tossed around was anime up till the Bomb Girl arc, movie for the International Assassins, and then like a smaller anime season for the rest of it, which would be the more Machima focused section, which I'd be down for. That sounds cool. Um, Mappa would definitely like the money they get from the movie because to point a picture, um, One Piece film Red just came out uh, over the weekend, and it is already the second highest grossing film in Japan, I think, period. Not even just animated, period. With the first one being the Kimetsu no Yaiba movie, and that's in the opening weekend. Uh, I think someone said that it is within striking distance of Kimetsu no Yaiba to take it. If not, it's going to be a very close race uh, for the number one grossing uh, weekend. Totals have to come out for everything, whatever. So, uh, Matt will definitely like that. I'm pretty sure that's what everyone thought they were going to do for Attack on Titan uh, Season 4 Part 3. <laughs> um, but, to the manga now. Um, I'm going to recap the last chapter just in case you forgot it. Last time we were reading Chainsaw Man, uh, we got introduced to a girl named Makita. Um, she's an average high school girl, hates devils, specifically Chainsaw Man. Uh, but grows an attachment to Bucky, who is a class pet, who is the chicken devil, and then is promptly murdered by Makita. But it is then revealed that the class present tripped her because Makita, had, uh, the teacher had a crush on Makita, even though uh, the teacher was sleeping with the class president. That was the whole chapter. Makita becomes the war devil, and that was that. Uh, with, with her eyes set on killing Chainsaw Man. Uh, Makita wakes up, and this is in this chapter, Makita wakes up, and Chainsaw Man has not appeared this week. Which is really big, because Chainsaw Man is supposed to be this big hero. And Makita looks at herself in the window, and sees that she doesn't have scars, thinks about what happened, and asks, was it all a dream? Where, uh, the War Devil strap says, this was no dream. Um, don't try to wake yourself up, this is reality, hurry up and accept it. Uh, now go eat and go to school, and this is a consistent thing we'll see. Disobey and I'll kill you. War Devil likes to pull that card of I'll kill you. And she straight up tells Makita, I told you this is no dream, you idiot. Face reality. Look at the news. Your teacher and class president both died yesterday. We killed them together. And uh, Makita is saying, excuse me, I didn't kill anyone. You killed them. And she goes to push the War Devil by pushing her on the shoulder. And her hand just goes straight through the War Devil. Mind you, War Devil is... Um, being shown as we saw Makita at the end of the chapter. So hair down, scars, and Makita style eyes, as I'm going to call them. Or Makima style, style eyes, sorry. And the explanation, you can't see me. Your brain is just seeing me as a hallucination. You died yesterday. I am the war devil. I have claimed your body. Uh, and then Makita just goes to school after that. And uh, we find out that war devil left half the brain intact. And she did this because she's unfamiliar with human society. Um, and she did this so they didn't find out that she's a devil and they don't kill her. And uh, Makita asks, why do you want me to go to school so badly? And we find out Chainsaw Man goes to the school. And Makita reaches into her pocket on the War Devil's request and pulls out a button. Um, and War Devil explains, a, de a devil killed by Chainsaw Man was found clutching that button. I checked into it and found out it used it's used for this school's uniforms. That means Chainsaw Man is going to your school incognito. And we found out we find out in, I believe, the next chapter, the chapter after, that uh, this is Tokyo's biggest school. So it makes sense that Chainsaw Man, or devils in general, would come to this school. And um, Ward of the Strip says, If you don't obey me, I can always take the rest of your brain. If I do, this time you will die. And we see that Makita doesn't want to. And we see the War Devil just, all she really has to do is just say, I'm not bluffing, you'll be dead and alone. Or you'll be dead and gone, sorry. And Makita just straight up says, I'd rather die than go in there. And that's when she bumps into a guy with his ear filled with piercings. Who might look a little familiar. Um, his name is Yoshida, apparently. Um, first time I read this and the first time I did a uh, review on this, I did not know his name. Uh, I knew he was familiar, but apparently we saw him in part one. I forget when. I forget what the context was. Apparently it was with Aki at some point, but his name is Yoshida, and he offers to take her down to the nurse's office. 
and um, when we get a little a little explanation on their power on um, War Devil's power, and she can possess Makita, which gives her the devil eyes and the scars, and she straight up. At, well, this is all uh, the scars in the eyes might not actually be there because we are seeing it from Makita's point of view. Uh, it could just be her seeing um, the war devil in her body. And uh, she just straight up asked, do you know anything about Chainsaw Man going to the school? Which Yoshida replies, I heard that was a rumor, but I just transferred here, so I don't know anything else. Uh, only that Chainsaw Man might be in the Devil Hunter Club or something, I don't really know. And war devil asks, hey boy, shall I make you my boyfriend? Which is the strangest way I've ever heard someone ask anyone out. And Yoshida Shrimp says, nah, I'm good, and walks away and says bye. And then we get an explanation uh, after Makita asks, why did you ask him out? That the War Devil has the power to turn whatever is theirs into weapons. And we get the explanation, if that boy fell for me, it would ma that would make him mine, right? I could turn him into a weapon. I want to turn as many humans into weapons as I can to go to war with Chainsaw Man. And if you remember correctly, uh, or if I remember correctly, um, Denji has this thing where he doesn't really care if people die. But he's got he's seen so many people die that he's gotten kind of tired of it. <laughs> so he's reached a point where he's like, I'm going to try to save people just because I'm tired of people dying. Which, cool on him. But um, uh, Makita thinks... I have to talk to a devil hunter in which the war devil replies, spill the beans about me and anyone, to anyone and you're dead. So she doesn't even have private thoughts anymore. Everything she thinks war devil will hear. And then we get the deal for the war devil and Makita. If we beat Chainsaw Man, I'll return your body. I trust you'll cooperate. And she says yes. She'll cooperate. And um, we find, and then we cut to the Devil Hunter group, which the club will patrol the city in groups of three. You have one week to bring back a dead devil. Do that, and you're actually in the club. To keep things fair, we'll be choosing your group members as we see fit. So just pretty much randomly. And our girl gets stuck with Yoshida and a uh, strange girl with glasses and light hair. And that's the end of the chapter, and they're partners now. So... This, I'm going to actually talk about this because it stems from this chapter. I have a theory of what's going to happen for Chainsaw Man. I had one for the single review I did, but it's kind of evolved now. Um, with the explanation that the War Devil can turn anything that is theirs into a weapon. With trying to seduce men, will probably end up being that whatever. I think it would be very interesting if Denji goes to this school, right? And we know it's Denji, but Makita doesn't know that Denji is Chainsaw Man. And um, the War Devil does the whole will you be my boyfriend thing. And either A, Denji just straight up refuses, just says, nah, I'm good too. Uh, I'm going to go now. Or he says yes, but not to War Devil. So he says no to War Devil initially, but uh, Makita comes back into her body and Denji kind of sees what she's about, sees how she's like when they're in the club together, and he grows to like her and not War Devil. And then we get a moment where Makita asks, will you be my boyfriend? And Denji's like, sure. And then War Devil takes that as her opportunity to be like, aha, I finally got this boy. That's another weapon. And then they put it into a situation where they're fighting a devil, uh, like a serious devil, and Denji um, is with her, and seeing no other way out of it, War Devil tries to use Denji as a weapon, so turning him into a bazooka or something, something weird like that. But it doesn't work. And then we get the explanation, it's because he likes you and not me. It's because he accepted Makita to be his girlfriend and not the War Devil. So he's not the War Devil's, he is Makita's. I think that'd just be an interesting way of doing it. But there's also something I'll talk about when we review Chapter 101. So that was the end for chapter 99, and I seem to have misplaced my gun. There it is. Going on to chapter 100. Uh, chapter 100 is named How to Walk Shoeless. And we see that the club is patrolling the school, and the girl asks, um, 
could a devil really be inside a school? And this is where we get the thing of this is the biggest school in Tokyo. Supposedly, devils sometimes live in the unused classrooms, so that. And we see that the girl forgot to introduce themselves. And she says that her name is uh, Yuko. Uh, she's super into Chainsaw Man lately. And then we get Yoshida's introduction where he says, Chainsaw Man's great, right? I like him too. And uh, Mitsuka introduces herself as Asa, Asa Mikita. And she's thinking to herself, this sucks where I had to get teamed up with him after she asked, or not her, but after she quote-unquote asked out Yoshida. And uh, Yuko asks, do you like Chainsaw Man? And she says, eh, as much as an average person. And then we see three girls from Asa's class walking towards her, where she tries to avoid eye contact with them, but they talk about her behind her back, and she says, ugh, she has some nerve trying to get a boyfriend so soon after what she did. She can totally hear you. Ha 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 You know how teenage girls are, whatever. Standard American movie. Um, and Asa says, I just remember I have something to do. Um, uh, I just remember I have something to do. I gotta go. So she leaves, ignoring Yoshida and Yuko, uh, Yuko asking. And Yoshida asks just straight up what's wrong, and she ignores it. Which makes me think that maybe he knows a little bit more about the whole situation with Denji, the, uh, with devils. Maybe one has a vague feeling of devils with um, her maybe he is a devil hunter like an actual devil hunter and that's what and that's how uh, him and Aki knew each other because I remember that was the context of him in part one so Asa goes to her locker to leave and opens it up and there are there is raw meat on her shoes and she walks outside without her shoes on because she doesn't have shoes and she just keeps walking and she just keeps repeating to herself I'm fine I'm fine everything's fine I'm fine I'm fine whatever and uh, War Devil says, don't walk shoeless, our feet hurt. Bullying is a commonality in communities without social fluidity, both human and demon. Shall I take care of it for you? And Asa yells out loud, I said I'm fine. And Yuko says, you are not fine. And we see that she walked outside shoeless as well. And she said, yep, going shoeless hurts all right. Uh, and she lends Asa one of her shoes. And if you walk with one shoe on, only one of your feet will hurt. So, uh, Asa doesn't want the shoe, so she tries to get it back, but Yuko runs away, so she can't return the shoe. And we get a few pages of them running around, seemingly having fun, if not Asa trying to return the shoe. And we get to see, uh, Yuko's house, and Asa, and she says, this is my house, you want to come in? And Asa says, no thanks. Um, Yuko offers the other shoe, but... Um, she says, I don't need your shoes. And then sell them. If they don't sell, you can just throw them away. Whatever, just take it. I let me get a very, like, it's a full page after the offer of her just walking, looking at the shoes, and thinking. And War Devil says, shall we go sell those? And Asa says, are you an idiot? Just straight up. Because this is obviously something that devils wouldn't know. This is an act of kindness. So we see that Yuko is a very nice girl. Um, she cares about Asa, even though they barely know each other. Maybe Yuko is up to something different, like sussy. Um, I don't really think so, but it's possible. Uh, this chapter doesn't really have a whole lot to dissect. I think Yoshida might know something more than what we think he knows. Um, maybe Yuko knows more or is more. Um, and we're seeing a little bit more of that... Um, Kind of Jekyll and Hyde personality that Asa has now with the split personality. It kind of reminds me of Deadpool. How you have the literal devil in her mind with the war devil, but then you have her kinder, sweeter, innocent self. So that was chapter 100 of Chainsaw Man. What a monumental chapter. <laughs> chapter 101, titled After School Devil Hunters. It opens with Asa trying to return the shoes. And uh, she just straight up says they were too small. And um, she and you go ask, do you want to go into town to look for devils after school? There'll be may way more devils outside in town, I guarantee it. We can also avoid the jerks uh, in school. Uh, and when Asa accepts, um, then we cut to them actually out in town hunting devils. 
and we find out that Yoshida skipped school, uh, and they ask, and um, Yuko asks if he's not serious about joining the Devil Hunter Club. And then we get some exposition when Asa asks Yuko, why did you decide to join the Devil Hunter Club? And she says, I wanted to be a Devil Hunter, duh. You can earn big paychecks without, even without a college degree. Not to mention my parents got killed by devils, so I'd be like an Avenger. Perfect, right? And then we get to see kind of their budding friendship with um, Asa saying, me too, my parents are killed by devil too. And um, we find out that they're, they're more similar than they thought. And this leads Yuko to say, oh man, this is going to sound so wrong. But we're kind of like manga main characters, don't you think? Then we should become devil hunters. We should join up as, we should partner up as buddies. Like two avenging angels of death. Um, and they, and we get to see that Asa smiles to herself. Which I don't know if that's an actual smile or if it's her chewing, but it looks like a smile. Let's be real. Um, and then we can see the war devil saying we should kill her. Just blatantly. And we find out how the kill process works. The remains of your kills belong to you. Let's kill Yuko and turn her body into a weapon. To kill a devil, you'll need a more powerful weapon, yes? The guiltier you feel about killing, about creating a weapon and killing someone, the more powerful it'll be. You like her. She should make a good one. Luckily, the city has plenty of abandoned buildings. Choose the location wisely, and you can kill with little to no risk. And this leads Asuka to a Asa to ask, there's no way I'm doing that. Are you insane? You're always jumping to violence. Is that the best you can come up with? And the war devil says, "You aren't making. You aren't here to make friends. Remember that." Um, and she fl and Asa flips out because she keeps referring to her as girl. She says, "Girl, this girl that stop calling me that. I've never liked it. I literally just told you to not call me that. My name is Asa. Asa, don't call me." And war devil says, "You don't call me by n my name either." And that leads to. Asa saying war devil just sounds weird and awkward because I'm going to guess in Japanese it is a very weird thing. Let's be real. There's a little break in the conversation. War devil leans back and says, I'll allow you to avoid the subject for now. She'll make a better weapon after you've grown closer to her anyway. War devil is difficult. Hmm. Very well. You can call me Yoro. Um, it serves my quest to kill Chainsaw Man. If it serves my quest to kill Chainsaw Man, I'll swallow it. Anything you say, Asa. And Asa replies, thanks, Yoro. So now we actually have a name. I don't have to keep calling her War Devil. And Asa's thinking to herself, kill Chainsaw Man, turn Yuko into a weapon. I don't care about all that disturbing stuff. I haven't had this much fun in forever. I couldn't care less about anything else. And then we see one of those, like, uh, nihilist people out on the streets. Doomsday is here. Doomsday is here. And he says, 20 people are not listening. Out of those 20, only 5 will die of old age. One out of the rest, 5 will die of illness, 1 will die of a traffic accident, 1 will die from homicide, and 1 more will commit suicide. That leaves 7 more. 7 out of 20 people are killed by devils, is what he's saying. And I don't know if that's an actual statistic in this world, but whatever. And he says, in fa the fact is, any one of us could be killed by a devil tomorrow, or even today. That's why I'm here to spread the truth instead. I repeat. Seven out of every 20 lives are abruptly snuffed out by devil attack. Which is when we see a double page spread of the bat devil murdering people in front of Asa and Yuko. Yuko? Yes, because Yoro is okay. Yuko. And the guy continues to say, make no mistake, mankind is at war with devils. And um, we can see all the carnage that the bat devil has caused and Yoro uh, comes to Asa and she says I have bad news and I have more bad news first we can't beat that bat devil in our current state and second I just learned that I can't take over your body when you're stricken with fear Asa back away slowly and quietly and then we can see Asa and Yuko dead sprinting away because you know comedy <laughs> um so, Bat Devil is back. And this led to a very big thing on Twitter, which I'm pretty sure we, the uh, Twitter Chainsaw Man fandom is kind of just taking as canon what's going to happen next chapter. If you remember back to the end of part one, it was said that 
that's technically the end of the chapter, so I'll let that one go. Uh, it was said that Denji only saves girls. Mind you, this is two teenage girls running away from a devil that he has fought before. This could be a very good way to reintroduce Denji into the story. Have Chainsaw Man come in, slaughter the Bat Devil right in front of him. Um, maybe give us a little bit of a... Like a mental conflict. Because, like, yeah, I want to kill Chainsaw Man, but he saved me. So there's kind of that, like, grateful to be saved. Don't want to kill him as much. But this is her mission, so she can't just not do it. Um, All in all, these Chainsaw chapters have been pretty fucking good. The, um... I'd say the last two before this one, so How to Walk Shoeless and um, the one before that, which I'm forgetting the name of, had very slow pacing. Not a whole lot happened in them, but they reminded me and a lot of other people of Fujimoto's one-shots. So uh, Goodbye Airy would be one. Um, I'm forgetting what the other one was. But Fujimoto's come out with a few one-shots since part one of Chainsaw Man has ended. And they kind of remind me of the pacing. It's more slow, it's more character-focused, and that kind of stuff. Goodbye, Airy is an amazing one-shot. I believe it's 60 pages, all in all. Uh, I could be wrong. could be more, could be less. I think it's either 60 or 80. It's a good read. Really slow-paced, and I really liked it. Um, so, I like the chapters. I like the fact that Fujimoto is getting a little bit more personal with his pacing. He doesn't really care about action, action, action. Which is, which is, in my opinion, how it kind of felt during part one. It was just constant action, which is cool. I like action, but it can get tiring eventually. Um, so, yeah. Um, Fujimoto will now be taking more breaks. Uh, we will not be getting cha uh, weekly chapters for Chainsaw. Um, so, that's that. Uh, this week is a break, so technically we would have get a chapter tomorrow, but we're not going to because uh, tomorrow is Tuesday. Um, we're going to get one the 16th, which is next week. Um, little thing about these reviews, right? Um, I used to do them for every single chapter, one at a time. Um, each chapter gets its own video, whatever. I quickly realize now that that is a um, very tiring way of doing it because that l leads to very short videos, like 15 minutes, which look digestible, and it's nice because you know exactly what you're getting into. Um, but the One Piece double review I did for the end of the – before the break happened made me think a little bit more about, like, it'd be nice to sit down and do a couple chapters at a time because it gives me more time to reflect on the chapter itself, kind of digest it. And for at least that, it showed me that one chapter leading to another is really cool. But I had the idea, similar to this – this was a three-week compilation video. Maybe just instead of doing a review for every chapter when it comes out, with Chainsaw Man coming out on, like, Wednesday probably, and the One Piece chapter is coming out during the weekend, maybe I can do weekly reflections. So do, like, so this next chapter, or this next week will only be One Piece because only One Piece is getting a chapter. But after that, you have uh, One Piece chapter... 1058 and Chainsaw 102 coming together. Talk about both of those. Um, and just kind of longer videos, more digestible. Less digestible, sorry. But you get more of my thoughts on it. Because you also get to see me just get into that mindset of digesting a chapter, breaking it down, talking about it. And instead of just pulling out of, and instead of me having to pull out of that for a few days, then going back into it for one piece, I get to just stay in that for like an hour or so um i wish i could have streamed this because i think this would have been really interesting to stream with chat um but there i knew there was supposed to be a storm coming through so i didn't want to risk the wi-fi not being enough to support a stream or my wi-fi going out uh and then i lose my stream so i decided to just record this throw it up um thumbnail will also be really interesting to make because i have six chapters that i have to <laughs> somehow do um It'll be interesting, definitely. But that'll be it for the One Piece chapter. Oh God, what was it? Um, One Piece chapter ten fifty four, fifty five, and fifty six review, and Chainsaw chapter fifty eight, ninety no, ninety eight, ninety nine. No, not that either. Ninety nine, one hundred, one hundred and one. That was it. Sorry. Um. 
I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you do think that the more uh, compilation-based reviews could possibly work, let me know. Um, if you will, if you prefer the chapter by chapter reviews, I might end up going back to those because it was kind of it was more of a digestible thing, which is kind of the main reason why I might go back to it. There are a lot of polls each way, but if you if you have a preference on which way you can you sh I think you sh think I should do them, let me know in the comments. If you're new here and you somehow stumble across this hour plus long video of one guy sitting in his bedroom talking about manga, um in between his shifts of work, um, let me know. Uh, and subscribe if you're new. If you like the video, like it, because um, that lets me know that this content or this style of content um, is nice and people enjoy it. And I'm not the only person that would sit down for an hour or longer watching someone talk about six chapters of manga. Um, but yeah, um, until next time, stay safe, have fun, read more manga, and before I go, Berserk will be getting its own reviews because that series deserves it. Um, and, yeah. Okay, guys. Bye. Also, this is now the signal for the chapter end and video end and begin. So, like...